Greetings, I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Welcome to this first installment of our We the People speaker series. You know, the time-honored tradition of heading back to school has begun for millions of American families across the country. However, this school year has started out as anything but traditional. School districts and families have spent the summer sorting out a myriad of ways to educate children in the middle of a global pandemic. The decision-making process has been complex, confusing, and sadly, political. With education being just one of many significant challenges facing our country, I'm pleased to share with you a new Bradley Speaker Series to help us make sense of these trying times. As mentioned, we're calling it We the People, and it's intended to provide insights and ideas from Bradley Foundation grant recipients. Their day-to-day -day work reflects just an amazing commitment to strengthening our communities and the foundations of American exceptionalism. We hope you enjoy it. Our first guest is leading education expert, Rick Hess. Rick is a resident scholar and the director of education policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where he works on K through 12 and higher education issues. He's the author of Education Week's popular blog, Rick Hess, Straight Up, is a regular contributor to Forbes and The Hill, and serves as the executive editor of Education Next. His research and expertise are currently helping countless educators and families across our country navigate through the, the really tough obstacles brought on by the pandemic. Rick Hess, welcome. We're delighted you're our first guest. Hey, Rick. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. We don't have much time, so let's jump right in. Uh, Rick, you co-authored a report earlier this year called the Blueprint for Back to School, which is a guide for how schools can safely reopen. Still early in the year, obviously, but do you have a sense for how those schools that have made the decision to reopen are doing so far? You know, honestly, I don't. Um, I've got a lot of anecdotal impressions from parents and educators across the land. Uh, I think the simple answer is what we all expect. Some are doing remarkable jobs of figuring this out, and some aren't. I think, I think if you back up a step, though, I think what's interesting is mostly what I hear from parents is no matter how good or bad a job they think the school is doing, as long as it's making a good faith effort to keep kids safe and keep staff safe, they're happy. They're appreciative because they know that schools are important, not just academically, but also in terms of connecting kids to the world around them, um, providing emotional and moral support. And when those schools have figured out a way to open their doors, even if it's just half time, I think everybody's willing to cut them a whole lot of slack. I mean, you've touched on this. Some parents and teachers have expressed some concern about reopening of schools, and you've acknowledged those concerns. They're, they're legitimate. But you've also written that the risks of reopening have just got to be weighed against the risks of not reopening. Expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is why Betsy DeVos uh, caught a lot of heat this summer when she spoke up and was pushing on schools to try to find a way if it was all possible. And she got a lot of brushback, which I just don't get. Absolutely, we need to worry about community spread. We need to worry about what it's going to mean to communities, kids who are going to take this home to their parents or grandparents. We get that. But as we look around the globe, nations around, <laughs> nations all around us, have figured out ways to get kids back. Maybe it's just the little kids. Maybe it's half time. It involves efforts at social distancing and mask wearing. But most places have figured out how to do a lot of this. And in the U.S., as we look across the nation's 100 largest school districts, 75% are 100% virtual. Now, some of those places, that's the right call for health reasons. But I think a lot of those places, it's just been the easier course. They've gotten pressure from unions. They've heard from parents who are reasonably concerned. And instead of saying, let's figure this out, they've said, well, let's just put a thumbtack in it for a while and see what happens. And the problem with this is we're missing how much this actually hurts kids in turn. When you think about the reports to abuse hotlines, we've seen hundreds of thousands of additional um, calls from kids who are being physically abused at home. Frankly, the mortality rate out of those calls could easily exceed what we're seeing due to COVID. Uh, we know that depression 
that uh, thoughts of suicide are up sharply among youth uh, 13 to 25. Uh, we know that kids who generally, when we have concerns about safety in the home environment, one of the leading uh, sources of reporting on that is teachers and school staff. That's gone away. And then the academic results obviously have been reported to be devastating when we try to estimate kids are losing a half year or more of learning with massive downstream effects. So it's not that we shouldn't worry about the public health component, but it's that we've got to make sure we're responsibly weighing the public health risk against all of the other harms to kids and frankly to families and parents who are being forced to try to figure out what do we do when our eight-year-old is at home every day. Yes. Is there a silver lining in this for choice in charter schools as many parents are looking for alternatives to virtual schooling, which is predominantly yeah, you know, what's happening in a big public school systems around the country? Yeah, I mean, this is America, right? I mean, one of our great traits is that we're able to find the silver lining in anything, right? It's Reagan's old line about the boy in the, uh, you, you know, barn full of manure, that there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> and look, um, you know, the reason I think this has been good for choice is not because people want policy solutions, but because school choice starts from a very simple premise that we're a huge, complicated country with lots of needs and children and families in very different situations. And it is hard for one size fits all school districts to provide what everyone needs. And when we talk about, is this good for school choice? It is, because some families have to go do their essential jobs. If you're a cop or a nurse, you can't sit and watch your kindergartner be on the iPad all day to go to school. So you need something else. If you are a marketing executive in an East Coast firm, maybe you can figure it out. So people of different situations, kids who are six and kids who are 16 have different needs. Families in rural communities and in dense urban communities are experiencing this differently. So I think what school choice does is it, cre it says, wait a minute, there's lots of different solutions based on what a family needs and what children need. One of the most interesting ones, which I'm sure a bunch of listeners are familiar with, are these pandemic pods that have sprung up. Pandemic pod is just a fancy label for a bunch of parents in a community saying, hey, kids actually need to see each other. They actually need to be in the room with a teacher occasionally. Let's get together and hire somebody. Like, at some level, it's hard to think that there's anything innovative about this. It's about as basic as you can get when you think about how to solve problems for kids. But when you see the bureaucracy lash out at this, when you see school districts threatening to punish or lay off teachers who wind up helping out pandemic pods, when you see the New York Times and the NPRs attacking pandemic pods as some kind of, you know, invidious racist strategy, what you see is, I think, a powerful line drawn between school choices ability to solve real problems for real families and real kids and a whole bunch of self-impressed bureaucrats and mandarins who have some kind of vision which seems largely divorced from the real experience of so many kids and families out there. The pods are great. It really is America at its best. Uh, teachers unions have, have made some, in my view, just remarkable demands in their negotiations to reopen its schools. Uh, and many of them aren't focused on education at all. Chicago Teachers Union, for instance, has, has asked for Medicare for all and uh, demands to defund the police. How can they justify that? They can't. They can't. It's astonishing. And what, what viewers might not know is that, so when the CTU was saying this, they said they, were, they weren't just saying we want Medicare for all. We're saying we're not going to reopen schools until we get Medicare for all. Well, first off, the mayor of Chicago has his about as much control over Medicare for all adoption as she does yeah. over U.S. policy in the Far East. So it's just a strange ask. But it shows a strange mindset that rather than saying, hey, we all have big disagreements. We all want kids to be well served. We want kids to get the health care they need. We disagree about how to do that. So we're going to try to elect Biden-Harris. We're going to, Instead of the CTU saying that, they said, aha, here's an opportunity. Chicago's families are on the ropes, especially struggling families stuck in small apartments where a parent has to go do an essential job to feed their kids. 
So here's a chance to try to really ratchet up the pressure. It is as much as I like and respect teachers, it is the kind of behavior that I don't, the unions, it's unconscionable. But the fact that members, the teacher members stand by while their unions do this, I have a problem with that as well. Absolutely. It's been a tough summer uh, in the United States, including in places like Kenosha, Wisconsin, just south of us here in Milwaukee. How has all the social unrest affected the learning environment? And, and in general, how are educators responding? All kinds of ways. I mean, one, you know, you just touched upon, you see to you, for instance, talking about defunding the police as a precondition for going back to school. So obviously, when we think about education, we've heard a lot of ripples from the police killing of George Floyd ripple through. We've heard this in debates around the 1619 Project. Uh, we've heard this in conversations about school policing and school discipline. Uh, we certainly hear this in conversations where the ed schools and university presidents of the world have decided that America is systemically racist. I'm not sure they actually know what they mean when they say that, but they have decided that America is systemically. And look, I think there's, I think there's two responses to this that we see in education and in the world around education. One productive, one not. The productive point is that all of us who were involved in education, I think it, 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 at our heart, we're on the same page in the sense that we know that education is about opening the doors of opportunity. That education is so foundational to the American creed because it is about making sure that we give every child the chance to live the promise, to redeem this birthright that we've got. And we're all on the same page, left, right, we get that. And that means that it's fair to say there's issues we probably haven't talked about as much as we should over time. Um, one of those issues, for instance, as I've long uh, fretted about, is access to excellent courses, to excellent teachers. Not just raising the floor, but it's very fair for social justice activists to say that when you look at talented uh, children with gifts, musical gifts or artistic gifts or uh, linguistic gifts in Milwaukee or Madison, if those kids are poor or if they're black or Latino, odds are they're not getting the same chances to develop those gifts that they would if they lived in a suburban community. And we've got to do better on that. And I think when we are raising those hard issues, this is a, a good and important conversation for the nation to have. There is some of that happening in schools. The problem is, I think in a lot of schools and colleges, there's a second strand. And this is the notion that we don't wanna figure this stuff out, that just expanding access to better schools, to better teachers, to giving families more choice isn't enough. That the only thing that's enough is to get everybody to stand up and somehow confess that they're sinners that they need to be re-educated to understand how fundamentally flawed and evil their nation is, that America has to be about, can't, about, can't be about teaching every child to work hard and be kind. The KIPP charter schools this summer chose this moment to say, we're afraid to tell kids to work hard and be nice. So instead of this as a chance for us to work together to give every child our shared gifts, there is this anti-racist push, which for my money is about as racist and Agreed. simple-minded and vicious a doctrine as I know of, which seems to imagine that schools should be in the business of promoting racial stereotypes. And unfortunately, when you look at the New York Times' 1619 project, when you listen to education, uh, the education uh, professorial community, when you listen to too many diversity trainers in too many school districts, they seem to be driving the conversation right now. So I think what we need to do is draw a very sharp distinction between the legitimate need to make sure that we're honoring our obligation to give every child of every race, of every creed, the opportunity that we promise, but not feel that that means we need to sign off or accept this poisonous garbage that so many are peddling as the solution to the problem. Absolutely agree. Last question. We're in an election year. 
hard not to think and talk about elections at a time like this. Uh, from 30,000 feet, how will this election, depending on which way it goes, impact uh, what it means for education in our country? Uh, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. Um, obviously, you know, the Trump administration has made clear that if they get reelected, a big part of this is going to be about continued promotion for school choice. I think Trump's support for school choice has had all kinds of ramifications, good and bad, for those of us who think choice is helpful. Um, also, I think he, he is, seems to have set a clear marker that he will push back on some of the problematic history and, you know, racial, uh, racial agenda setting that we've seen from the universities and from some of the extremists. And again, given Trump's rhetoric and his approach, this will be both good and bad. If Biden wins, um, there's a lot of concern in the choice community about what that means for K, uh, uh, in the K-12 community about what that means for school choice. Um, certainly Biden would go after uh, pri uh, for-profit charter schools without a doubt. Uh, he will absolutely try to zero out the Washington D scholarship program. But one of the nice things about school choice is it is better insulated against Washington uh, than we, right? This is both a blessing and a curse, mostly a blessing, uh, that there's only so much a hostile administration can do in the short term. Now, Biden's Department of Justice could file a lot of nuisance lawsuits, like we saw the Obama Department of Justice start to do, uh, but there's not much he can do legislatively. The bigger stuff Biden will do legislatively is one, he wants to give, he, he would dramatically expand uh, the power enjoyed by teacher unions uh, he would override uh, state laws uh, regarding bargaining in a number of ways. Second thing that he would do is uh, he has pledged to sign the Equality Act right away, which uh, functionally erases any efforts to have gender distinctions when it comes to sports, uh, to single sex uh, locker rooms, uh, single sex schools. So we would be in for a massive uh, earthquake in terms of how we think about issues of sex and gender in schools and colleges across the land. And probably the biggest push of Biden-Harris would be on free college and, uh, and loan forgiveness, uh, which would functionally uh, bring uh, 75, 80% of America's colleges uh, under the thumb of lawmakers in Washington. American higher ed would start to look a lot more like Medicare. And uh, you know the downstream implications of that are staggering. Indeed. Rick Hess, thanks so much for joining us. We truly do appreciate your insights and your expertise. Uh, uh, wonderful being with you today. And thanks to all of you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next time on another episode of We the People. <laughs>